info. Um, but what we're going to do is, Dr. said, is get this recorded so that we can share this um, with folks uh, this afternoon. Um, and so um, this is a project, this is an um, event with the, what we call the Narrative Change Project, which is a storytelling initiative um, of the H.E. Bud Foundation uh, trying to you know, help us all ask the question, who is our neighbor? And to think better, tell better, deeper, truer stories about um, San Antonio and the challenges that families and children are facing in different parts of town. And so we do that in a variety of ways. We make some media and we host events like this one um, normally that are not Zoom bombed. And um, we do um, uh, other kinds of experiences um, to, um, yeah, just to confront uh, ourselves and our community uh, with uh, some, uh, some tough realities and truths about, uh, about San Antonio and challenges that we're facing here. And today uh, we're excited to be um, with um, uh, Ramiro Gonzalez of the uh, West Side Development Corporation. Elizabeth, do you wanna take it from here and introduce Ram? Okay, I'll turn it over to you. With my, this is my colleague, Elizabeth Coffey. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. I hope you're staying uh, warm right now as well and dry. Um, uh, like Patton said, my name is Elizabeth Coffey. I am part of the Narrative Change Project and specifically run um, our Narrative Change Cohorts, um, which is uh, an 18 month long experience for us. Uh, for a small group of people, I'm sorry, I think it muted me. Uh, for a small group of people to journey on uh, inside of the realities of that we explore inside of the Narrative Change Pro Project, like Patton said, um, uh, that are focusing on social, racial, and economic inequity. Um, and as the foundation, we do not come as any type of expert in this area, but want to invite hosts of voices to a table. Um, and those voices represent different perspectives and viewpoints uh, from us to see through the many lenses required to view our city uh, for the mosaic that it is with its diversity in opinion, in culture, in race, in ethnicity, et cetera. And with the necessary responses uh, to systemic issues we find in our community as well. Um, one of such complexities is the complexity of neighborhood development. Um, we see a lot of organizations across our city focusing on this, um, on this particular issue through community activism or community organizing or community development. Today, what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, neighborhood development through the lens of economic inclusion. And my guest will dive deeper into what that means shortly. Um, and speaking of my guest, this is my friend, Ramiro Gonzalez. Um, he, there are many reasons to have a conversation with Ram. Um, some of the reasons I choose to, and I'm lucky enough to be doing this with him today, but some of the reasons I choose to have conversations with Ram is that he is kind. He is just the right amount of sarcastic. He is knowledgeable about our city and he is qualified and speaks from a host of important experiences that have brought him to where he is today. And where he is today is that he is the president and CEO of the West Side Development Corporation, a nonprofit community economic development organization that focuses on both revitalization as well as economic advancement of the West Side. Uh, previously, Ram served 15 years with the city and helped to facilitate in uh, the development of over 7,500 housing units in the downtown area and more than $80 million of public investment in urban redevelopment projects. So if you can't already tell, he is an advocate for maximizing real estate for community benefit and demonstrates this not just with his civic engagement, but with his nonprofit engagement as well. Um, this includes developing a program uh, to build accessory dwelling units for economically vulnerable families, as well as an effort called Good Acres to help congregations reimagine their surplus property to solve community problems. 
Um, Ram is also the managing partner of Urban Lazarus Partners, which is a uh, real estate investment group. But he also serves on multiple boards, um, including the Midtown Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone, the San Antonio Affordable Housing, and the Office of Urban Renewal of San Antonio. He is a uh, he is a San Antonian. He was born and raised here. He graduated from Edison High School um, and then from UTSA. But the most important thing that you need to know is that he is married to his high school sweetheart, Erica, and they are proud uh, yet exhausted uh, parents of two happy boys, Elijah and Abram. Uh, with that, and I, I, will, I will hand the floor over to Ram, but I'll say this. Um, as you have questions, feel free to populate the chat because at the end of his presentation, we'll get an opportunity to address some of those questions. I'll prime the pump for us a little bit and ask three or four um, before uh, addressing some of the ones that you pose into the chat. Um, but that's just to get, get your mind going. So jot those down as we go. Ram, I'm excited that you're here and I hand the floor to you. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um... Uh, thank you for that fantastic introduction. I really appreciate the, the appreciation of sarcasm. So that's very near and dear to me. Uh, thank you to, you know, many of my friends here on the panel. Yeah, I see, you know, Patton and Dacry and Marcus and Hillary and just all the family over at the HEB, uh, HEB Foundation uh, for really shedding some light on the West Side in particular and kind of what we're, what we're facing and how we plan to be uh, really uh, turning the direction of the West Side for the prosperity of our families and businesses. So thank you so much for giving, giving me this time. Uh, I'm going to put up my, uh, my screen here. Oh, actually, let me see. I think I need permissions here. I think I need to be made a co-host so I can share my screen. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, one moment. I have to reorient now. Okay. Aha, there you go. I can be taught. Can you all see that? All right, great, great. Uh, so again, my name is Ramiro Gonzalez. I'm the CEO. I have the uh, honor and privilege of being the CEO of the Westside Development Corporation. Uh, WDC, as it's called, has been around since 2006. It was created by the city uh, as a local government corporation and a nonprofit organization that is focused on the revitalization of the West Side. I talk with my hands a lot, so just get used to seeing them, okay? Um, and so the, the focus of the organization is to really bring economic prosperity to the west side of San Antonio. And for the longest time, the focus has really been small business development. And more recently, we're taking a focus more towards a holistic view of the west side and the entire ecosystem of the west side. And we'll get more into that here in a moment. So when we talk about the west side, west side of San Antonio, kind of very high level, uh, you know, population is about 106,000 and let me also mention that when I talk about the West Side, I'm talking about the WDC boundary, which is about 15 square miles. It reaches from about 35 to uh, I-35 to the east near downtown, uh, to the west to about Acme, Callahan Road, north to Woodlawn and south to, uh, to Highway 90. So this is kind of the area that we're focusing on. And so it's about a population of about 106,000, uh, mostly Hispanic, of course, and mostly small business. There's not a lot of employers in this, big employers in this area. It tends to be a lot of small businesses. It is the oldest Hispa Hispanic urban neighborhood in Texas. And that's something I actually just realized pretty, pretty recently, uh, which is really interesting to me. Um, it's, you know, if, you're, if you've spent most of your life in, in San Antonio, chances are you trace your roots back some way, somehow, some the uh, grandparent or something back to the west side. So, so I really like to see it as the cradle of life for, for San Antonio. Has over 55 murals, so it's an amazingly vibrant area. And it's also home to a subgenre of, of what's called, called the west side sound. So it has its own special place 
in the kind of music industry in, in America because there was an actual uh, distinct kind of uh, uh, a sound and music that came from the West Side. And the, the signature one that I think of that really represents it, which I know everybody knows, is hey baby que paso you know that's that is the west side sound and so and and, and daiquiri and my friends here are going to put a, a link to that song so you can enjoy it and not have to listen to me sing it but that is that is some of what makes the west side what it is um and then of course it's neighbor centered this is truly a community where people mow each other's yards People will fix each other's cars, they'll watch each other's kids, they'll hang out with each other just over the fence, you know, just talking. This is exactly that kind of neighborhood that you kind of dream up, you, you dream of growing up in. Now, that being said, there are still also challenges on the West Side. The West Side is, is, is a high poverty area. It is actually the zip code uh, with the high, it, it is the poorest zip code in San Antonio, 78207. Um, and it's it, about half of the population is in poverty. The other half is pretty close to it. Um, but a little over, a little under a quarter uh, has high school diploma and a little less than 3% has a college degree. And so there's a lot of, of need and there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of, of, of low income families in this area. There's a lot of struggling in this area. 90% of the students are economically uh, disadvantaged. So it is an area of, 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 of great, um, great need in an economic sense, but it's very rich in its social fabric. There's also an amazing stock of housing on the West Side, but unfortunately for much of it has kind of reached its useful life. And so it's in dire need of investment. And so there is a crisis happening on the West Side in that not only there is affordable housing, but it also is much of it is also substandard. And it is literally in some cases falling, falling down around people. So there's a desperate need for investment back into these properties to maintain the housing stock that is there and the affordable housing as people know it today. There's also a very large retail presence on the West Side, but there aren't a lot of major employers other than that, as I mentioned earlier. This creates some limitations from a job perspective, which is why organizations like WDC exist to help foster new business in the area and to provide additional options. There's nothing wrong with retail jobs, but they don't tend to pay a living wage. They don't tend to provide benefits. And we wanna be able to help our, our West Side families you know, grow and, and, and climb that economic ladder. The inverse is also true in that businesses, small businesses are also limited in their growth, in their potential growth, because if they are located in a high poverty, low income area, then there's only so much that they can grow. And so as a result of that kind of leads to the next issue is that in many cases, when people start to climb that ladder, they end up leaving the West side. And it's an unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance, you know, over the past, at least this was per the 2010 census, there was uh, every year there was a loss in population on the West side. When we get the 2020 uh, census results back, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that we'll see what that looks like, but chances are it's probably continuing the same trend. And so it's more than just treating the individuals and treating the families and treating the businesses themselves. It's how do we actually treat the sense of place on the West side to make it in an, a healthy environment for investments to be successful, for businesses to be successful and for families to grow. It, is, it does require a more holistic approach to ensure that success across the spectrum. And so I'll talk a little bit about you know, how, why, why is it the way it is in some cases. And in most cases, you can trace it right back to redlining. Redlining is a practice whereby certain areas were deemed unsafe or unfit uh, for lending and investment by financial institutions uh, and as you can expect, many of those lines kind of followed, you know, the, the kind of racial makeup of the city. And so that's true also here in San Antonio. You can see the red areas on this map are those areas which were deemed, uh, you know, unfit for investment. Don't invest here. You know, you can see, if you can see it in the legend there, it actually says that those areas are hazardous. So as a result, the families in these areas did not have the benefit of borrowing money to buy their home and build wealth and then pass that on to their family. The business owners there didn't have the benefit of, of, of accessing capital to leverage that debt to build, their, build and expand their business. People who have been successful on the west side, on the east side and south side have done so because they are scrappy. 
because they have figured out just ways to do it. They borrowed or they, they you know, in some cases, they had to borrow at, at extreme high interest rates just to make things work. And so they're resilient for sure, but it's because of these kind of redlining practices that that even had to occur. Whereas in other areas of the city, that simply wasn't the case. There's also a number of barriers other than just the stop sign there. You take the stop sign away, you still don't know where you're going or what to do because it's so confusing and it's not really suited to where are you trying to go and let me help you get there. In most cases, many of the policies that exist back then and even today are suited more for the general population, which in some cases is the non-ethnic population. Um, and so our, our communities of color struggle with navigating these barriers that don't seem to reflect what they're trying to accomplish and the special circumstances that they're in. And so as a result, these barriers, to, even if they seem incidentally uh, small, incrementally, they amount to massive barriers that prevent access. And I'm dealing with one of those even today uh, with the West Side Development Corporation. We have a policy that we're, uh, you know, kind of wrestling with the city on as it pertains to our loan and grant. And whereas they see this one policy, uh, this kind of new policy that they've erected um, being to create consistency ac across their program, to us, it's a barrier to equity because now there's something there that wasn't there before that makes it more difficult for a business to take advantage of small, small loans and grants. And this all also just feeds into the general the generational cycle and influence that, that tends to spur inequity. You know, generations who are used to being told no, they then, you know, uh, kind of feed that into their children and expect them to be told no as well. Those who, uh, children who grow up in poverty are likely to lead a life of poverty themselves. And so it becomes this generational cycle that is difficult to break because in some cases, you don't know anything different. You know, when I was growing up and I wanted to go to college, I even heard from my own uncles, you know, and this is, I don't know if this is just a Hispanic culture thing or not, but, you know, I was often told, well, you know, when I would say I want to go to college or I want to go to law school, you know, the answer was kind of like, well, that's for white people. You should just, just come with me and work at the warehouse because the, the bar was so low that look, just, just do well, just make some money, pay your bills. And, and that's good. You know, this other stuff, you know, eh, you know, I don't know if that's for you. You know, and they're, they set it out of love, but it, unfortunately, it's kind of being fed by their past trauma and experiences from what they experienced growing up. Now, all that being said, don't feel, don't feel bad for the West Side. Don't pity the West Side. The West Side has Im immense things going for it. It's a beautiful place. It has tremendous assets and opportunities. So what we're interested in is how do we help to start leveraging that for the benefit of our communities, for our families and businesses in the area? The West Side has two lakes on it, uh, you know, on this side of the city, unlike anywhere else in the city. And I got to give my wife credit. She took that photo of the of Woodlawn Lake. It's a beautiful photo, and it's usually in all my virtual backgrounds on Zoom. So, uh, so I have to give her credit for that one. Um, but it, you know, two beautiful lakes, with, which you know have seen improvement over the years. Uh, thank God, and, and and thank the the city for those investments and all those who fought for those. Uh, investments, but how can we better maximize them, these and all our other public gathering spaces to act to activate them and get more act, uh, economic activity of them from them, that way we can reinvest it back into our neighborhoods. We have three universities on the on the west side, long standing, I mean that looks like Buckingham Palace when I look at Lady of the Lake, that's just incredible. Um, and they're beautiful. And so in each one of them, well, combined, they probably have about uh, 20,000 students between the three of them. That's an immense economic impact of those students. Granted, most students are broke, but some of them will have money. And think of the brain power of these students and the capacity of them to volunteer and have, have community impact. Many of these uh, universities have programs where they're, you know, getting students involved in the community, but how can we also open that up more so that their campuses are more open and, uh, and inclusive of the community around them? I know that the, the, the people at these universities are passionate about the West Side. Um, and, and so we wanna continue that conversation and see, okay, how can we get a kind of coordinated effort uh, to make sure that we're, we're making the most out of these assets on the West Side? We have the highest concentration of nonprofits on the West Side. Um, and, you know, and, and, and then it largely follows all the immense need in the area. 
There's also, and I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I would guess that we probably have the highest concentration of faith communities also in the West Side. You know, I grew up in a family church over on the West Side on Menchaca, and, and there is a church on every corner there, and which is great because that is a huge community of people who want to be serving the families of the West Side. And so it is absolutely an asset, and there are so many people who are doing amazing work on the West Side. And so we want to see how can we better leverage and also better coordinate that because it is an incredible asset that we have that other areas simply don't. We also have a very young workforce. The median age of the uh, area is about 33. And, you know, so there's incredible opportunity to leverage that workforce, uh, you know, provide job skills training so that they can be successful, so that they can go and then bring that economic impact back to their neighborhood and be successful in that way too. Now, unfortunately, many of them, for the same reason we talked about earlier, they, you know, only 25% have a high school diploma, less than 3% go to college. So there are barriers there that still need to be explored to understand why, why that is and how can we help connect them in better ways. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying any of this in that no one's doing this work. They absolutely are. We have many great nonprofits who are working on this. And so, but, you know, how do we continue that conversation? How do we get more of our people in the West Side into these programs that can help benefit them in the long run? And on top of that, we're our proximity to both Port San Antonio and, and downtown San Antonio, the tech center, financial center of our city, and Port San Antonio, which is about 2,000 acres of logistics, manufacturing, aerospace, technology, jobs that are literally, I mean, just across the highway from the west side. And, you know, fortunately, we also have the WETC, the, the west, west Side Education Training Center, uh, which is about to build a new $25 million facility on the west side to help train more of our west side uh, residents for these jobs at port at you know downtown and other in these other leading industries to make sure that again we can bring more of that economic activity back to the west side and then of course the culture itself on the west side it is perhaps our most valued and treasured asset because and it's something that we need to protect and we need to, to treat as vulnerable because these are the things that Quickly, quickly and easily fade away over time if we are not intentional about it. But it is in itself a reason to be on the West Side, a reason to visit the West Side. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I think that might actually be Augie Myers there on the actual, uh, the, this is the Musica mural, which we are working with uh, David Blancas to restore. He, he, he painted that, I think about 10 years, and he's right there in the bottom right corner uh, when he originally painted it. Now, what that does, now none of these assets and opportunities and the greatness of the West Side is a secret necessarily. You know, there's it, the West Side is does represent the kind of last frontier of development in our city around our downtown. And so it's it's no secret that these assets and opportunities exist there. And eventually we are going to see that development coming. We've, we're already starting to see little traces of it here and there. And so right now we really stand at a crossroads of which future do we want for the West Side? One possibility is that, well, we, we just resist the development and we, and we resist the investment and just pretend like it's not gonna happen. And then unfortunately we end up getting decimated by it. And then, you know, the West Side becomes a shadow of its former self. You know, the other alternative is we lean into that development. We foster that economic growth and put strategies and tools in place now so that we can actually make sure that we can leverage that growth and capture it through our families and businesses so that 10 years from now, we're standing shoulder to shoulder with the same people we are now, but they are better because of it. That's the future that we want for the West Side, but it doesn't happen by accident. It happens through intentionality and it happens through strategic planning. And to that point, I'm very proud to say that the city council this morning approved uh, the funding for the West Side's first inclusive economic growth strategic plan. It also includes a COVID uh, recovery component. This is huge because there's, there's, to my knowledge and those of I've, I've asked, we've not had one of these before, uh, to specifically uh, as it pertains to inclusivity. It's one thing to say, how do you foster economic growth in a community? It's another thing to say, how do you leverage that growth? How do you make sure that that growth protects those most vulnerable and is to their benefit? 
that is a completely different exercise. And so we brought in uh, HRNA out of New York, who is, who is uh, uh, they're just experts in this field and have been able to survey the landscape across the country to identify those tools and strategies that have been successful in different communities, specifically those that kind of look like the West Side and bring them to bear so that we can kind of look at them and then our local steering committee can then influ influence that path going forward to determine, okay, what does a solution look like for here, for on the, on the West side of inclusive economic growth, ways to leverage this growth so that we can benefit uh, our, our, our existing families and businesses. And when I talk about leveraging growth, sometimes it seems abstract. So I wanna point out three specific examples. One is a tax increment reinvestment zone. This is, and this is the West side uh, TERS. They're actually the ones who funded the strategic plan. And so a, a, West, a TERS works by establishing an area and then whatever tax that area was receiving at the time it was established, the city keeps taking that, you know, their piece of the property tax. But the city commits that anything over and above that amount can now go into that fund for that area. And so that's what this West Side TERS does. Now, five years ago, that TERS had zero money in it. Now today, because of some of the growth that it's capturing from other areas, there's about $2 million that goes into that fund every single year. And that can be used for community objectives, uh, uh, to fulfill community objectives, public improvements, affordable housing. One great example of this is the Esperanza Center is in the process of developing or putting or, or doing their Riconcito de Esperanza project over on the west side which is a block of city houses that they are a block of uh, houses that they are renovating to become almost like a museum of sorts and celebrate the history and culture of the west side and that's a fantastic use of TERS dollars. That's about, I think about $1.5 million for that project over three years. And it represents an excellent example of how development and growth can be leveraged to meet a community objectives like that of cultural preservation. Another example is SAISD for the first time in its history was able to issue a bond without having to raise the property tax rate. That's unheard of for them. Normally that it would be a big deal for them to have to do something like that. But because of all the development and growth that has happened in the area, they're able to actually pay debt service out of some of it because of their increased tax base. And so now that means better facilities in SAISD. That means better technology, better schools. They can pay their teachers or they can hire more teachers. They can do more enrichment programs. It means more capacity and opportunity in this area that for the longest time tends to get you know, the short end of the stick. Now, what does it mean for Edgewood to have that kind of capacity? Edgewood ISD has suffered for a long time and has not been able to issue bonds because it, it has the problem that SAISD has always had. Until it starts to generate that, uh, increase that tax base, it's going to have a challenge trying to, trying to have that same ability to issue debt that SAISD finally has. But that's certainly a way to leverage that, that growth. And then finally, example here is the creative housing solutions. How can we help property owners in the West Side leverage their own property to take advantage of, of those wanting to be in, in that area? How can we create affordable housing and help them benefit from it? Maybe you know, we help them build a casita. Maybe they live in the casita and sell the, or, or uh, rent out the main house uh, to help finance improvements. There's all kinds of ways that we can help families uh, leverage their own property uh, for their own benefit and the long-term benefit of that community. At the end of the day, you know, if you hear if you hear nothing else from what I'm saying today, you know, the focus is to create systems uh, for success. You know, it's often said that the West Side is is program rich but system poor, and that's really the role that WDC is meant to fill is to create systems. Uh, and focus on that larger ecosystem of the West Side to make sure that it's functioning successfully. In most cases, the pr program delivery tends to look like ringing a dinner bell, right? Kind of setting the table, ring the bell, everybody come and get it and take advantage of it. But what we've seen is that typically West Side families and businesses don't participate at the rate of, of most others. And part of that is because one, they didn't even hear that bell or they don't think that bell's for them. Or if they do, they're turned away by what they see or, who, or that no one there looks like them. So unfortunately, they miss out on a lot of the opportunities that others are able to take, take advantage of. So program delivery needs to look less like ringing the dinner bell and more like Meals on Wheels, 
how do we take it to them where they are so that they understand and can see it from someone who maybe looks like them or understands them that this is indeed for you. We've been experiencing that even with the, with the current PPP program uh, for small businesses. Most of them just think, no, that, there's no way that that would actually work for me. And so we have to have long conversations to make them understand that this is essentially free money for you to, to help keep your business afloat. But it actually takes them a lot of discussion to get them uh, past that trust factor. Now, when we talk about building that kind of system, we have to look at ways that that can be sustainable in the long term. How do we make sure that we build systems uh, on the West side for long-term success, not just today, but that are lasting and that can be maintained? And so one of the tools that we're exploring right now, and we'll be talking with all of our businesses and commercial property owners, is the creation of a West side public improvement district. What this is, is creating a district, uh, the West Side property owners essentially create, fund, and control the funding in this district for improvements and enhanced services of the area. So it very much is uh, community-driven, community-owned. It's the, it's the property owners that ultimately determine how those dollars get spent for the improvement of the area. And that's something that once we set it up, then we have that tool going forward to make to see how can we can how we can actually implement the strategic plan that we're adopting and all these other systems that we're talking about to make sure that we're achieving these community objectives and that we're leveraging that growth the way the way that we were discussing here. Now, I would have put a picture of my own kid with spaghetti all over him, but I couldn't find one. But Anytime we do something that is community driven, it's going to be messy. It has to be messy. You know, we don't have all the, I certainly don't have all the answers. Even the consultant doesn't have the answers. It is basically a collective uh, effort for everybody to bring what they have to the table and try to figure these things out. You know, the city is, is, is well-meaning, but the city is not really built to operate on a micro level. You know, it, it tends to operate at that level. And so we need to figure out how can we as a community start to put these solutions together ourselves. And although we may all, all share in the same mission and vision, sometimes we disagree about how to get there. But we have to accept, we accept that it's going to be messy. It's going to be a little contentious here and there. That's okay. We're, we need to be able to seek uh, progress and not necessarily perfection. And so last thing, if if anything I've said resonates with you and you're interested in seeing how you can participate in what's happening on the West side and where we're going, you know, I encourage you to reach out to me. You know, there are various ways to participate one through the steering committee that we'll be putting together for the strategic plan. If you're an organization that's working on the West side, we'd love to have you part of this conversation. Um, impact committees, you know, we're going to be creating these impact committees around each of the components of the strategic plan going forward to ensure their momentum, to ensure that, they're doing what we're, we're accomplishing, what we set out to do, and then that we can adjust as necessary and that it truly is community owned. And then finally, think about where your dollars go. You know, one, are you shopping? Or are, you, are you spending money at local businesses, small businesses? But then also, I want to go and step further and ask you, where are you investing your dollars? If you got $500, you could actually risk a little bit. That if that $500 may not make a huge difference to you, but it could literally change the life of a small business owner who could use that to suddenly take their business in a new direction. So I want you to think very critically about how you're spending your, your, those dollars. And if you don't know what the, who those businesses are or how to connect or how to do that, talk to me. We'll put a fund together. We'll figure it out because there's ways that we can, we can collectively get together and help these small businesses. And I'd love to, to, to work alongside you to do that. Uh, my information is down there at the bottom. Again, if you have questions about anything that I've, that I've covered uh, aside from this conversation today, which I'm very excited about, um, please, I'd love to meet with you, talk, uh, sit down and have a conversation and get your, your sense, which may be different than mine, of, of what the direction is and what the direction should be so that we can figure this out together. Thank you, Ram, so much. I, I know you just did a fire hydrant of information <laughs> at us at trying to make up for time that we lost uh, previously. So thank you so, so much. And um, please continue to put your comments and questions in the chat as we go. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I know it will have to be brief so that we can wrap up by our original end time. 
But Ram, I, I've gotten some questions privately and then there's some comments in the chat around this as well. So you, you, we, we, you talked about this word inclusion and I believe that you're touching on something that is like this tightrope that you're walking between economic growth and displacement of families. Um, that there is um, also rightly so, uh, a, a fear of what that growth could ultimately do to the neighborhoods that people have um, lived for generations and love dearly. And um, if you feel the same way I do about San Antonio, then it's hard for you to separate your own identity from yeah. that place. And so, um, and how, and so I, my question is with this word inclusion, how are, how is WDC sensitive to those fears that represent, yeah, generations of, of many times trauma, um, but then also realities that are currently being faced by people today? Yeah. Well, inclusion means different things to different people. How we mean inclus inclusive economic growth means what is, what does it look like to use the economic growth and development that happens in an area to benefit the most vulnerable, to make sure that they're, they're standing there alongside you 10 years from now and didn't just survive, but are thriving because of it. And there's no quick and easy way to do it. You know, and I also say there's no perfect way to do it. You know, there's no such thing as far as I've, I've known where economic growth equals zero displacement. To some extent, there will be, and some of it is 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 a good thing for some of those families because they're able to get you know five times what they paid for their house, and for many people, that is the wealth that they were looking to generate from their own home. But we want that to be their option. They shouldn't have to choose and say, okay, well, I can't afford to live here anymore. I have to sell. So, what does it look like to be able to counsel them in that way so that they know, you know, what their options are and how can they how can they benefit from this? You know, inclusion from an economic growth standpoint, um, it, at its kind of most basic level, looks like job creation. You know, if we're able to bring economic growth and help our businesses be, be more successful, then that creates local jobs in the area. That then allows them to increase their economic situation and give them options. We don't want them to leave the West Side, though, just because they, they, they're able to uh, make more money. We want to make sure that they can stay. So as part of that means making the West Side as a, as a place of a, 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 a increasing the quality of life on the West side. So that it's a place that they want to stay, that they want to raise their kids. And that's really looking at all the different components of the ecosystem. So inclusivity means not just economic growth for the sake of economic growth, but economic growth for the sake of, of, of those most vulnerable in that community. That's helpful. Thank you for that. And I see lots of people asking specific questions around how that plays out with WDC and the type of programming you're offering. And my encouragement to all of you is to, um, uh, there's the website in the chat as well as Ram's email. Um, but I have one other question before also opening up to some others that have gone in here, but I've also gotten this privately as well. Public improvement district, you know, that idea and that reality might put people's guards at first. It may put people back on their heels initially. So it's kind of a two part question. Um, do you have examples of talking with community members about this reality? How are they responding to this idea and what WDC is, is doing in this regard? And two, you already touched on this because there are people here who are wondering, what does it mean to get involved in that work? Do you want other people from other parts of town involved in that work? Or what's the, and what, kind, what are the, some of the invitations you're extending? And I know you went through some of those already, but what are some of the invitations specifically you're extending to this group and other groups right now? Um, as as you as you talk about public improvement district, so we are just starting the conversation on public improvement district and what it means. I mean, it, it, uh, let's just be honest. It means money. It means that the the commercial property owners in the area would contribute annually to a fund, and then that fund would go towards you know, certain improvements and mostly enhanced services for the area. Which means it was kind of that big those big six items that were part of that pyramid is how do we focus on advancing progress in each of those areas to lift up the area together? But the base of that period was community engagement. So how do we create systems and networks of communication and, and, and infrastructure so that everyone on the West side is no more than maybe two degrees of, of separation between them and the resource that they need? You know, that's what we need to, that's the intent of that, uh, that PID is to be able to develop that system and not just for today, but so that it is there for the long term until it achieves 
uh, its its objectives. And it, it is a bit controversial. You know, we we need to talk to, and it this is not something that is imposed upon anyone. This is something that a public improvement district is something that where all the business owners or all the commercial, that it would apply to only commercial property, but commercial property owners would come together and say, yes, we value this. We think this is this is worth investing in and we wanna see this community uh, succeed because ultimately they, they have the most to gain monetarily from the success of this area. And that's why PIDs tend to run this way. So, but how can we even leverage that? to make sure that we have other, uh, other items in place to make sure that we're constantly feeding that economic growth back into the community to again, uh, uh, help, our, help our most vulnerable, help our families, help our businesses, not only stay in their homes, but be successful as a result. In terms of involvement, um, you know, I don't care if you've never set foot on the West side. If you care about these issues and you, you want to be involved, you want to help, reach out, I will figure something out, even if it's making copies. I, we, need, we need people who are, who are committed to these issues. You know, we have, as I said, we'll be creating impact committees around each of these components around the strategic plan. And so some of that service might look like, okay, you're a, you're a volunteer project manager for that impact committee to just keep things going, to keep track of those things. We're just not a big enough team. And even with a PID, we probably wouldn't be to really focus on everything that needs to happen because the successful and the successful inclusive growth that we're talking about means operating at a system level, not just one program, not just one component, not being transactional. It means being holistic, strategic, and operating as a system. So it takes a, it's going to be a lot of moving parts all at one time. We could use all the help we can get. That's amazing. I, I wish we had way more time than we do. Um, Ram, you know, we, we have a kind of a list of questions going here and privately that might be worth exploring. And uh, maybe maybe what we can do is, is submit answers or responses to those uh, written and then provide access to all of you who have some of those questions and uh, later after, the, after this uh, uh, call. Um, it, we are so grateful for uh, your time today, Ram, and in the way uh, that you have expressed uh, your deep love for the West Side. That is apparent. I know we're on screens, but I can feel that energy <laughs> through this, and it's it's contagious. And I think in a time when the foundation is posing this question of who is my neighbor, you have made it very clear uh, that you are our neighbor and that and what it means to activate um, and have a response to that uh, question ourselves. So thank you for the invitation to, to message you. I hope you all take advantage of that. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, Dak, I'm gonna pass it over to you and uh, so that you can wrap us up and share what what it looks like to be involved uh, with the narrative change after this. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Elizabeth. I am really um, excited about what our narrative change work. And just to echo what Elizabeth said, learning about our neighbors, I live on the South side and it's just great to learn about the West side and how we're all connected. Um, as part of our narrative change work, you know, we've been doing these, these lunch and learns to really explore right, who our neighbors are across town. And so our next Lunch and Learn, right, is February 23rd with Dr. Dorinda Roll, who's actually an organizational and transformational expert. And she's gonna be talking about um, what does it mean, right, to, to speak out and speak up and to really be an advocate for socioeconomic um, equality here in San Antonio. And what does that look like from a neighborhood neighborhood perspective? What can we do individually? What can we do collectively? So um, we just dropped that. The, it's called, okay, you want justice, now what? Right? And so that will be February 23rd. It will be from 1230 to 130. And as a next step for today, I know this, uh, we still had a great turnout. So I'm happy to see all of your faces. We will make sure that we share the recording with you via email so that you can share it with your colleagues who may or may not have been able to attend. Um, and we just really are really excited about continuing to journey together. Um, thank you so much, Romero. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so Bye. much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ram. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.